Hello learners, you are watching video on Hermion Squad, a group of literary students initiative. If you are new to this channel, please do like, share and subscribe. Today we will deal with restoration period. This period is a lengthy one, so we will complete it in two videos. Then let's do part one today. Restoration period The period from 1660 to 1700 is known as the restoration period. The restoration period refers to the restoration of the monarchy when Charles II was restored to the throne of England following the 11-year Commonwealth period during which the country was governed by Parliament under the direction of the Puritan General Oliver Cromwell. From the beginning of the Restoration begins the process of social transformation. Of this epoch, Dryden, the greatest man of a little age, as he has been called, was the one regarded as the complete representative and exponent. So, the period of restoration is also called the Age of Dryden. Characteristics of the period The Age of Restoration was categorized by an immense change in the general temper of the English people. The period was a sweeping reaction against Puritanism and everything that it had stood for set in. And this reaction went so far that, together with the galling restraints which religious fanatism had unwisely imposed, moderation and decency were too often cast aside. England now touched low water mark in its social history. During this period, gravity, spiritual zeal, moral earnestness and decorum in all things which distinguish the Puritan period were thrown to the winds. The natural instincts which were suppressed during the previous era came to violent excesses and also in this period the renaissance delight in this world and the unlimited possibilities of the exploration of the world could no more fascinate the people of England. But in the greater part of the restoration period there was awareness of the limitations of human experiences without faith in the extension of the resourcer. There was the disposition to accept such limitations to exploit the potentialities of a strict human world. During this age, there was a rapid development of science. The interest in science began to grow. This growing interest in science resulted in the beginning of rational inquiry and scientific and objective outlook. This objectivity, rationality and intellectual quality also enlivened the literature of this period. In 1662, the Royal Society was founded for the improving of natural knowledge and to promote scientific research. Sir Isaac Newton was a member in it. And this Royal Society revolutionized scientific method and the dispersal of knowledge. Hence, the establishment of the Royal Society was a landmark in the history of England. In this period, literacy expanded to include the middle classes and 
even some of the poor. Also, the writers of this age, including women, began to advocate for improved education for women. And this period is one of the increasing commercial prosperity and global trade for Britain as Britain established several trading companies all over its colonies. The major idea of the period was that of empiricism. Empiricism is the direct observation of experience which infers that experience including experimentation is a reliable source of knowledge. And this concept itself had a profound impact on society and literature. During this period, there emerged several other social ideas including politeness, a behavioral standard to which anyone might aspire, and new rhetoric of liberty and rights, sentiment and sympathy. Major Events of the Period Restoration of Monarchy. The restoration of King Charles II in 1660 marks the beginning of a new era both in life and literature of England. In the Commonwealth period, Charles II, the son of Charles I, escaped to France. After the death of Richard Cromwell, the people of England brought him back and made him King of England. The people of England were suffering from tension due to the strict rule of Cromwell. Thus, the nation welcomed the restoration of Charles II. The change of government from Commonwealth to kingship corresponded to a revolutionary change in the mood of the world nation. It seems a curious contradiction at first glance to place the return of Charles II at the beginning of modern England as our historians never wanted to do. For there was never a time when the progress of liberty which history records was more plainly turned backwards. The Puritan regime had been too severe, it had repressed too many natural pleasures. Now, released from restraint, society abandoned the decencies of life and the reverence for law itself and plunged into excesses more unnatural than had been the restraints of Puritanism. The inevitable effect of excess is disease, and for almost an entire generation following the restoration, England lay sick of a fever. Socially, politically, morally, London suggests an Italian city in the days of the Medici. And its literature especially its drama, often seems more like the delirium of illness than the expression of a healthy mind. The restoration was the greatest crisis in English history, and that England lived through it was due solely to the strength and excellence of that Puritanism which she thought she had flung to the winds when she welcomed back a vicious monarch at Dover. The chief lesson of the restoration was this, that it showed by awful contrast the necessity of truth and honesty, and of a strong government of free men for which the Puritan had stood like a rock in every hour of 
has rugged history. Though fever, England came slowly back to health through gross corruption in society and in the state. England learned that her people were at heart sober, sincere religious folk and that their character was naturally too strong to follow after pleasure and to be satisfied. One of the most significant aspect of restoration literature is the return of theatres. In the Puritan era, the Puritans who saw theatre as zespits that bred all kinds of immoral behaviour shut them down in 1642. For 18 long years, there were no theatre companies or public performances of plays in the land of Shakespeare. But when Charles II was restored as King of England in 1660, one of the first thing he did was reopening theatres. As soon as the previous Puritan regime's ban lifted, the drama recreated itself quickly and abundantly. The theatres came back to vigorous life with new types of plays and performances which were different than the before, although they became more exclusively oriented towards the aristocratic classes than they had been earlier. The success of the plays of restoration period was dependent upon the strange staging devices, weird plots, and dramatized language. This period saw many innovations in theater. During the restoration period, the most common manner of getting news would have been a broadsheet publication and the period saw the beginning of the first professional and periodical journalism in England. With newspapers growing in size and number, the restored monarchy made every attempt to control the paper's appearance and the content it contained. And the government attempted to monitor the paper was with the introduction of the Licensing Acts. The Licensing Act of 1662 pertained to periodicals and public writings and how they had to contain the author's and publisher's name and had to be given to a licensor before publication. The control of printing was in the hands of the government and all papers had to be licensed in order to be produced for the public. But whenever those laws lapsed, innovations abounded, which led to the different forms of the paper. In two successive years of the 17th century, one city experienced two enormous tragedies, the Great Plague of Lenten, and the Great Fire of Lenten. The Great Plague of Lenten, lasting from 1665 to 1666, was the last major epidemic of the bubonic plague to occur in England. The outbreak began in the late winter or early spring of 1665. By the time King Charles II fled the city in July, the plague was killing about a thousand people a week. The plague killed roughly 15 to 20 percent of the city's population, while the Great Fire of Lenten, which was a major conflagration that swept through the central parts of Lenten, burned about a quarter of Lenten's metropolis making around 1 lakh people homeless. And 
though the city only officially recorded a small number of deaths from the fire, the real death toll was likely quite high. With the comeback of Charles II, England's social, political and religious tenets have transformed. This era also witnessed the rise of two political parties. The king, with all his pretensions to divine right, remained only a figurehead and the Anglo-Saxon people, when they tire of one figurehead, have always the will and the power to throw it overboard and choose a better one. The country was divided into two political parties, the Whigs and the Tories. These parties were to play a significant role in English politics. The Whigs sought to limit the royal powers in the interest of Parliament and the people, whereas the Tories supported the divine right theory of the king and strove to restrain the powers of the people in the interest of their hereditary rules. The rise of these political parties gave a fresh importance to men of literary ability. Almost all the writers of this period had political affiliations. The religious controversies were even more bitter. The supporters of the Puritan regime were fanatically persecuted. The nation was predominantly Protestant and the Catholics were unduly harassed. The religion of the king himself was suspected. His brother James II, who ascended the throne after Charles II was a Roman Catholic. But both the political parties, the Whigs and Tories, were largely devoted to the Anglican Church and when James II tried to establish Catholicism in the country, then the entire nation rose against him and united in England's last great revolution. And after this bloodless revolution of 1688, which called William of Orange and Queen Mary to the throne, was simply the indication of England's restored health and sanity. King Charles II Charles II was the king of Great Britain and Ireland. He was the king of Scotland from 1649 until his disposition in 1651 and King of England, Scotland and Ireland from 1660 until his death in 1685. He was the eldest son of King Charles of England and Queen Herita Maria. During the Puritan interim, Prince Charles was in exile in France and other parts of Europe. On 29th May 1660, the day he turned 30, Charles was restored to the English throne as Charles II. He who became the King of England at the age of 30, after a period of exile and dangerous escapes, was not at all like his unfortunate father. He was the cleverest man of the Stuart dynasty, able to carry out well-planned schemes which he hid under a pleasant and charming disposition. He was handsome, popular, cynical and unprincipled. He trusted no man but that deep-seated distrust was clocked under guileless smiles and amiable words. Like his Elizabethan predecessors, 
he kept his finger on the pulse of the nation because he realized how indispensable the people's favor was for a king charles the second was a clever man but parliament and the people had progressed so much that however much he has done he could never re-establish the absolute monarchy of the tudors constitutional monarchy had become an inevitable fact therefore he adjusted to the new principles because his only aim in life was never to be forced to leave the shores of england by inconvenient revolutions charles the second and his followers who had enjoyed a gay life in france during their exile did their best to introduce that type of foppery and looseness in england also and for his luxuriant hedonistic life he came to be called the merry monarch in 1662 he married catherine of braganza a portuguese princess but their marriage was childless resulting in some uncertainty about the succession reign of charles the second charles reign was marked by a great deal of change and upheaval with the restoration of monarchy the atmosphere of gaiety and cheerfulness of licentiousness and moral laxity was also restored there was laxity everywhere in life the court of charles the second was the most shameless this country has ever known infidelity and profligacy became fashionable and was glorified in the royal court the moral ideas of puritanism were turned into just and those who still upheld the cause of domestic virtue laughed at as hypocrites or denounced as sore sectaries even outside the narrow circle of court and aristocracy where things were at their worst the spirit of corruption spread far and wide and while piety and goodness were of course cherished among individuals the general lowering of the moral tone was everywhere apparent the king was a debauch who had a number of mistresses and he is also thought to have had 12 illegitimate children he was surrounded by corrupt and degenerate ministers and corruption was rampant in all walks of life during his reign the great fire and great plague of london that followed the restoration of charles the second were popularly regarded as suitable punishment for the sins of the profligate and selfish king charles the second tactfully dismissed the convention parliament due to continuous conflict within parliament and a new parliament was constituted this new parliament which was summoned in 1661 was called the cavalier parliament because it consisted of young enthusiastic royalists it was the cavalier parliament that decided the religious question charles had promised to observe religious tolerance to all sect but the cavalier parliament was very strong on this point the official religion of england was to be anglicanism and anglican churches bishops were to constitute the church of england during his reign the church of england was 
restored as the national church and the church of church and state were deeply intertwined too in england during the late 17th century coffee houses became extremely popular and a large part of british culture was shaped there as those were the places for men to discuss current issues in 1675 king charles ii made an attempt to shut down coffee houses with an edict and stated that coffee houses have produced very evil and dangerous effects and were also a disturbance of the peace and quiet realm however shortly after this went into effect there was too much of an outcry from the public that king charles the second had to back off the edict between 1665 and 1667 england was at war with the dutch the second anglo dutch war which ended in a dutch victory in 1670 charles the second signed a secret treaty with france under this treaty he agreed to convert to catholicism and support the french against the dutch in return for his support during the third anglo dutch war between 1672 and 1674 he received subsidies from france leaving him some room to maneuver with parliament and in 1677 he arranged the marriage of his niece mary to the protestant prince william of orange in a bid to re-establish his protestant credentials reign of charles the second king charles the second though he outwardly conformed to anglicanism and favored a policy of religious tolerance he secretly favored catholicism which the parliament could not accept and that placed him at odds with his strongly anti-catholic parliament and in 1673 the test act was passed according to this all civil and military officers had to take communion with the anglican church at least once a year meanwhile in 1678 There was the rumor of a popish plot of the Catholics led by Titus Oates, a renegade Anglican priest, to assassinate Charles II. Though the popish plot turned out to be fictitious, it found an anti-Catholic hysteria throughout England, leading to the exclusion crisis. As Charles II had no legitimate heirs the next in line to the throne was his catholic brother james who eventually became james the second the two political factions emerged at this time the whigs who wanted to exclude james from inheritance and the tories who supported james accession The Whig Party was founded by Anthony Ashley Cooper, the first Earl of Shaftesbury, and they supported the accession of James Scott, Duke of Monmouth, who was the eldest of Charles II's illegitimate son. In 1679, the Whigs introduced the Exclusion Bill. which sought to exclude catholics from inheriting the english throne in the house of commons then the king interfered dissolved the parliament and imprisoned shaftesbury on the charge of high treason in order to prevent the passing of the exclusion bill shaftesbury was later released and 
the bill was passed in the house of commons however it was defeated in the house of lords charles ruled without the parliament for the rest of his reign in 1685 king charles the 2nd died of a sudden illness and on his death bed he converted himself to catholicism he was then succeeded by his younger brother as james the 2nd of england and james the 7th of scotland restoration period part 1 ends here we will be back with part 2 very soon so thank you all and stay tuned